Good evening, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Sniper. Many of you probably already know that. But considering that the Art and Now Lecture Series is open to the public, we always encourage people from the public to attend. Uh, feel the need to do a formal introduction and to hype it next week. In a second, I'll hype tonight and hand over the uh, the introduction process to a student, an object, an officer, an object. But uh, let me tell you about next week. So I'd love to see everyone here next week, besides those in my class, which are required to come. But spread the word. Tell more people. We have plenty of seats tonight. The last couple lectures, we've had a full house. I often, it would be great to always see a full house. So those of you in my class who are uh, in any and every major around the campus, spread the news about the Arts Now Lecture Series. Uh, spread the news about the topics that engage you. There, you always learn a lot from a visiting artist, and always, you know, it's always a surprise. But a lot of the work crosses through every major, every discipline, every issue that exists in the world. And next week uh, talks about water, which lines up perfectly with Great Lakes Water Institute, the fact that Milwaukee is becoming a real epicenter for fresh water. So next week, uh, B. Stephen Carpenter is uh, presenting, giving a lecture called Artistic Intervention Curriculum and P Public Pedagogy. Carpenter argues that the, global, that the global water crisis demands creative interdisciplinary responses in the form of artistic, uh, curricular, and pedagogical interventions that raise awareness, engage research, and take action. So that is next week, and the list goes on and on. You can always find the schedule for artists now on the Peck School of the Arts website. You can share it, you can spread the news, broadcast it. It's really important that a public university has a public program uh, for visiting artists that's open to the community. Obviously, there's a built-in class, and everyone on campus is welcome, but it's really designed, it's also designed for anyone and everyone in the city to come and hear incredible visual artists and designers and art, and art historians and art educators talk about what they do, the role of the arts. Um, tonight, we're very fortunate to uh, Anna Karbarkis speaking to us. She's originally from the Chicago area, perhaps. Uh, teaches out at the University of Oregon. Um, but I want to introduce um, Katie Hancock, who will introduce our guest, because the object group of the metals department has unbelievable energy to take real ownership in this Artists Now lecture series and work together and network and bring in speakers. And perhaps KT could tell us a little bit about object and introduce our guest. <coughs> I'm just going to hold this. Hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Hancock, also known as KT, and I'm the secretary of the student organization in Jewelry and Metalsmith and Object. It is through this student organization that we are able to bring artists like the lovely Anya Kavarkas to these talks where we learn about her progress and work as an artist. We host an annual jewelry sale in our own UWM Union Concourse every fall and a juried exhibition in the spring and would be absolutely delighted if everyone here came to check it out. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here and here's a little background on Anya Kavarkas, our visiting metalsmith. Anya Kavarkas has a diverse <coughs> metalsmithing background and has been integrated within several galleries and exhibitions and holds an outstanding position at the University of Oregon in Eugene, where she is currently an assistant professor and area head of jewelry and metalsmithing. She received a BFA in jewelry and metalsmithing from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and an MFA from the State University of New York in New Platts. In 2007, she was the recipient of the Siena Gallery Emerging Artists Award and presented the solo exhibition entitled Blind Spot. Upcoming exhibitions include a solo collaborative exhibition with Mike Bray at Siena Gallery in Lenox, Massachusetts, the Decorative Impulse at our own Villa Terrace in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the International Jewelry Exhibition at Center Materia in Quebec, Canada. She was a recipient of the 2008 Oregon Arts Commission Individual Artist Fellowship and the 2007 Rotessa Foundation Grant in support of the publication of The Thinking Body, an exhibition co-curated with Kate Wagle. Her work is included in collections such as the Tacoma Art Museum, the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art, the Rotessa Foundation, and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. 
She is represented by Sienna Gallery in the Lenox, Massachusetts, and Gallery Rob Knuth. Who dies? In the Netherlands. Um, and just a plug for the upcoming military show, we have some cards up here. Um, the Decorative Impulse brings together objects from six international metalsmiths whose work actively engages with the decorative arts to pose provocative questions about the place of the decorative in current art dialogues. The artists, Jamie Bennett, who's here today, really great, Justine Hackenberg, Rory Cooper, Anya Kabarkas, Malia Tokol, sorry, and Jonathan Wall draw from a range of cultural and historic sources such as Victorian jewelry, old master paintings, export porcelain, mass-produced jewelry, and botanical prints. Their works bring the often marginalized category of the decorative arts to the fore as a strategy and aesthetic choice. The Decorative Impulse is a collaboration between the Militaris Decorative Arts Museum and our own UW-Milwaukee Peck School of the Arts. This show is co-curated by our talented Yevgenia Kaganovich, who is the head of jewelry and metalsmithing. So this is going to be an amazing show at the military this Friday. Um, the opening is from 5.30 till 8.30, and you guys should all try and go. It's amazing artists, great, great area to be in, you know? So, and here's Andy Marcus after that long but appropriate intro. Victorian. 
plan, and it, is, it uh, informs what they understand as the projection of wealth, a civilized image of success, and the American dream, basically. And I've always been resistant to this um, Victorian colonial aesthetic, and so much of my group of work is rooted in overturning it or examining it in some way. Um, the Victorian and Baroque period <coughs> appropriated aesthetics from a variety of origins and moments in history. Uh, they both sample the exotic and accumulate previous history in a conflation of disparate styles without regard for um, the cultural implications or context of these sources. So this is 17th century French wallpaper that appropriates the Damask um, textile of Middle Eastern origins, um, and at the time the French were colonizing in the Middle East and borrowing their goods and their forms. So um, this is a Victorian wallpaper that is a direct kind of appropriation of that French 17th century wallpaper, and the Victorian period is very much a revival of a conflation of historical styles. And this is all a source of I think that I show you this modern sink actually, because in some way I think I have been colonized by the modern aesthetic with this kind of streamlined, stylistic surface that conceals function. Um, and a toilet, something that um, conceals the truth of its function in this kind of image of cleanliness that is in direct conflict with the um, reality of its function. So in some way it um, has the implications of civility, but the reality of the object is that it's so kind of vulgar. And um, I'm also interested in modernism at this moment of, you know, this obsession with progress and with advances in technology, the invention of the streamlined train, and that at the same time they were sort of designing toasters and that they were so obsessed with um, fastness that um, a toaster would have a surface of a streamlined train applied to the surface of it, even though it has nothing to do with the reality of its function. So that kind of uh, relationship of surface to form in dreamscene also. And this is um, one of my initial inquiries into the specific juxtaposition of something that was highly ornamental, um, highly present and historic, and a surface that was explicitly modern, industrial, very absent and blank. And I was interested in how these aesthetics um, were, were so polemic, and I, would, I wanted to conflate and then cancel the different, their difference. So in making this piece and, and the pieces that follow also, um, I fabricated this thing with quite um, an excessive amount of labor, actually. And I would then start dumping the piece in white paint, like a can of white paint. So it was this really kind of fragile thing, and I'd start dumping it in paint. Um, and I would do that until the paint would start to kind of plug up the details. And I secretly wanted to dunk them until the form was um, completely obscured, but I couldn't really lose all of that labor that I invested into the production of them. Um, so I would stop at this point where the form would be bloated, but um, you know, still like uh, understandable. So bloated, but um, obscured in some way. This, I've also, um, I was really interested in making brooches, like pieces that are worn on the chest as a format, because it's a really um, image-based format, so you look at it and you understand it functionally. But I'm interested in making these pieces um, three-dimensionally. So um, I often deal with the sort of front and back um, of these objects. So the front will be one presented image and the back is, is something else. Um, and actually, when I made this piece, I remember making the front and then this chandelier form that was sinking into this wallpaper pattern. Um, I remember preferring the back to the front and so I, Kind of, I put it on my body and it sort of, um, the ornament in the front sort of lifted the, the wallpaper silhouette up and it just looked totally wrong, like it looked kind of front and back at the same time. So I tried to make a piece which was that, the back was the front and the front was the back, but it was so intentional um, that I felt like it, um, it wasn't as successful uh, as the previous piece, so I, I actually sort of wished I had retained that previous one. <laughs> Um, and then I was just interested in this kind of hybrid form, this like part chandelier and part wallpaper. Um, and then in this piece, this part wallpaper fragment and part ring. So um, that you would think it's a ring, so to try to wear it would expose the pin back, and then when you wear it as a pin, the ring projects forward. So it's always wrong in the way that you wear it on your body. Um, and then in this work, I was um, interested, I just, I really wanted to reduce the fronts of the work to nothing. 
So I, I wanted to get more and more blank on the front, and I wanted the back of the piece to kind of weep um, ornament or sort of weep jewels. Um, so I just started working more in this way, and, and they would always be sort of lifted from the body and always looked like the front was sort of supposed to be the back, but never were they correct from the back either. <coughs> Um, and then I was really interested also in um, the illusion and the artifice and um, mirroring. So I also made a series of pieces. I think this is actually from grad school, this piece is. Um, but I, and I was really kind of obsessed with the chandelier form for a long time too. But I made these pieces that were half of a chandelier. Um, and the back kind of oval plane, that back plane is a, although it looks kind of black, it's actually a mirror, like a piece of silver that's to a mirror finish. Um, and so it reflected that half chandelier as this sort of full chandelier on the body. But I'm interested in that mirroring plane and how it recedes and becomes this depth, like especially on the surface of the body, that the rest of the chandelier recedes into the surface or the plane of your body. Um, at the same time, though, sorry, at the same time, <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, I um, thought this was really straightforward. Like you understand it as an object, and then you understand it as an illusion, and then so I started to um, make them more um, three-dimensional and a little bit more complicated in terms of how you started, how they visually unravel. So with this one, again, it's a half chandelier with a mirrored surface, but then behind that mirrored surface, there's this space that the other half of the chandelier exists within. Um, and so in the, and the, the, in it, the oval crops, um, crops the, the chandelier so it's not, image of the chandelier, um, but then the chandelier in the back kind of completes that image. So um, from some positions of looking, the object looks fully complete, and then from some positions of looking, it sort of dematerializes or becomes visually confusing. So um, I was really interested in um, wearability and that somehow complicating um, like the contingency of looking, because I think I'm responding a lot to image culture and these really um, immediate images, this sort of quickness of the image, and I'm interested in objects because they have the potential to slow down that immediacy. And I sort of continued with this investigation. Um, with this double mirrored plane, um, again, these two half chandeliers, one is just a half, and there's nothing that completes it behind the mirroring plane. And then the other one is a full chandelier, again, bisected, and the smaller one sits against the body, and the other piece sort of lifts away from the body. And then, with this piece, it's just a single chandelier with three mirrors reflecting it, and it's sort of this sea of um, ornament reflected back into itself. So I started looking um, at a really sort of specific jewelry history. Um, I was looking at sort of the decorative arts history and wallpapers of chandeliers, and so then I made a very specific decision to source jewelry. Um, and so I was looking at Baroque jewelry at this time, um, and uh, Marcus Gunter, a sketch from 1703, and um, starting to replicate that in a series of ways. I'm not going to return to this image in a while. Um, but this was the first piece I made based on that historical sketch, where I sort of simulated the sketch, sorry, silhouetted the sketch, and then um, at the point where it seemed sort of absurd to produce that form, um, I sort of intersected it with this um, shallow cube that obscured the con that, that part of the form, and then on the back, the, the silhouette of that form. Um, <coughs> Victorian brooch of the late 19th century, and then <coughs> the that was sort of laid in the front, and then composed of serial <coughs> images um, on the back that were just silhouettes um, of, of that object, the, the detail of that object um, silhouetted one after the other. Um, this is the first piece from an exhibition that I thought was really significant for me, um, a Blind Spot, and it was at Siena Gallery. And I was really interested in this idea of delivering information in, in, or visual information in a kind of slow way. So again, following that blank um, where I made jewels weeping behind the object. So making these blanks that appeared even more blank from the front. Um, and then the back would be much more ornamented and, and weeping jewels. In this piece, where it's a kind of flat image, and then the back is um, highly ornamented. And then this piece that is um, uh, actually behind those three briolette drops are an encrusted surface of jewels that are um, concealed by this flat facade of this silhouetted um, jewel. 
And um, I was interested in that idea of concealing that encrusted layer. It's also rooted in an image of a Baroque piece of jewelry. Um, and in the Baroque period, um, the uh, jewelry was changing so much that actually it was so much more about the jewels and the metal was only the setting from jewel to jewel to jewel. So I was interested in this idea of something encrusted with jewels but then completely obscuring that in some way. So that's a back image of that piece that those are all settings for those jewels. <coughs> The, the surface of the jewel is, of the um, facade is right in front of them. The computer's being really slow. It's thinking on that page. Um, this is an untitled brooch from the Victorian <laughs> Um, and then I made this kind of replica silhouette um, where in the middle, it was sort of this flat streamlined piece and in the middle there was a sort of blushing of um, facets that were happening and right behind the blushing of facets was a cluster of, a dense cluster of those jewels that you never really had visual access to unless it was sort of flipped around. And I um, came back to this sketch. So I kept, this is actually, I've made other work with this sketch that I'm not necessarily showing, but I, keep, I kept repeating or returning to this sketch, and it was, um, at first I thought it was kind of problematic. Um, and then I started to think about what kind of an interesting problem this was. Um, that, you know, part, part of the problem with the history of jewelry is that it's really descriptive. So I would be reading these historical jewelry books, and um, it, it would be describing something, and it's almost as if it wasn't edited, that, you know, the text would sort of fall off and pick up, and it was a really kind of problematic history that was written. Um, and it's really descriptive, one of connoisseurship and ownership rather than a critical inquiry into the kind of, this kind of material culture of the time. Um, and also, the, um, like a, a lot of times I was looking at sketches. So in the Baroque period, fashion was shifting so quickly um, that pieces were melted and the jewels were recycled. So they actually didn't have the objects, um, they don't exist anymore to document them because obviously they couldn't have been photographed at the time. So I was looking at the, these sketches to represent this history, and I thought that was a really interesting um, problem. So that I was looking at representations to suggest what history was, and that idea of the representation is really um, interesting and significant to my practice. So I'm looking at these kind of traces of history. And so from that image, I felt a little bit more conscious about what my inquiry was, actually, that I started to make these pieces that were um, informed by really being a sketch. So they were white, I would map the surface so they were really um, kind of dead, paper <coughs> like. And then I would rub steel on the facets and it would sort of make this line that was kind of graphite. Um, so um, they were like part drawing, part object, or like part a simulated thing because a drawing is only an idea of a thing, it's not an actual thing. Um, I mean, actually it is a thing, but there's this idea that a drawing is a simulation. Um, so that became really interesting to me. <coughs> and this piece sort of follows suit in that way. And in this piece, um, I was really interested in how, like what parts of the sketch would sort of break down, because I'm looking at these sketches and there's all this information that's kind of lost or not, um, and that's sort of um, depreciated through the reproduction of this copy. So um, in the part where I couldn't necessarily understand the visual information, I just started intersecting that spot with a, a blank form, or I, I, wherever I couldn't understand, I would just eliminate entirely. And then in this piece, the front and back of the object were supposed to be simultaneously represented, um, and so I made a piece that um, just literally was a little literal translation of that. And I was interested in how. Um, that they couldn't not decorate the edge of this as they decorated the front edge. So there was this impulse to decorate even though they were trying to be diagrammatic. And I'm returning to this brooch again and making this reproduction where um, I started to think about the sources and how the sources would inform these decisions. I was making. So when they were these sketches, I would make them really dead and white and have these graphite um, lines to articulate their forms. Um, and when they would be from a photograph, I would actually make them in metal because there's something about their materiality I could understand. And so replicate, actually I'm saying replicate, but the front of this is a blank silhouette and the back is a replica of the object. So I would replicate it in um, metal. And so um, it, I, I also would 
all of this is carved. So, oh, I mean, I haven't even said that yet, that every single, single piece I've made is carved. Every single jewel on these pieces is hand-made. So, um, but then I would, on the surf, I would, to the surface, I would sandblast it. So it has this really industrial surface. So there's this kind of tension in the object in terms of its production. So it's handmade and it's almost like about being really caring. And then the surface is really industrial. So it's about kind of camouflaging that care. And then within the same exhibition, I was looking at these kind of um, Victorian sources and I was looking at these Baroque sources. So I'm looking at all of these kind of moments that are borrowing from each other visually. Um, and then, um, and I was looking at paintings, and I was looking at um, photographs, and I was looking at sketches, so my sources were really varied, and I start to think about that a little bit differently soon. Um, but I, so I looked at these portraits, these Baroque portraits, um, and soon I'm going to shift to this really contemporary moment where I'm looking at this like internet archive of the Academy Awards. So um, I, I shifted to the Baroque because of it being this moment of imperialist expansion, and um, the material culture of the time reflects this in all of its excessiveness and exoticism. So because people at the time couldn't invest in land, they invested in objects such as exotic shells, and then even, you know the sort of many toss paintings of the time, they're fruit that's so ripe it's about to rot. Um, and so that really interests me, that idea of Fanny Toss, and that um, the Baroque period seeks to reveal the artifice of the idyllic lifestyle, that they produce something so lush and um, uh, so ripe that it's about to kind of die. So it's thinking about, you know, remember that you are mortal, um, you can have all these material goods, but, but they will fade and so will you. Um, so that really interested me. And also, um, I'm, I'm interested in Martin Jay and Svetlana Alpers and how they talk about the Baroque period. Um, that it's one of the first times in history that painting isn't just a mimetic representation of the world, but also about being about the visual experience and perception in some way. Um, so they have this kind of quality of being hyper real. And I don't know if you've actually seen Baroque paintings in person, but when I was younger, I would kind of go to the Art Institute of Chicago, and um, there are these paintings where the lace is so um, explicit from afar, it looks so hyper real, and then when you approach the um, surface, it totally dematerializes. So that was really interesting, interesting to me that the surface is really haptic and dense and thick, um, but the image of it is so explicit from afar. So that really interests me about um, the Baroque period. And so this is the first kind of thing I um, made related to this. Um, to, to these, these replications. Um, but this was a portrait of Maria Trent that I was showing you. This is a Rembrandt portrait of Maria, Maria Trent. And I um, replicated the earrings that, I, that she was wearing. And I started to think about, like from the images I was working with, I was sort of obstructing what I couldn't really see in terms of reproductions of obscuring information or blurring it. Um, but in this image, I actually would just replicate what I could see, what was sort of presented frontally to me. So she is sitting at an angle that's so part of the earring I can't see, I would just crop. Um, rather than um, assume what, it, what information was there. Um, so, um, Jonathan Crary also talks about the Baroque period and um, its hyper real quality because it's actually very closely related to photography, the way that he sort of frames it. That it's limited by the, um, or it's not limited, I'm sorry, by the structures of the frame. It's kind of a random cut into an image, um, and that um, Svetlana Alpers suggests that the Baroque is an art of describing <coughs> rather than one of explaining. Um, and it's very um, fragmentary, and the frames are kind of arbitrary. So that is a, something that interests me because I start to source photographs um, of figures with jewelry on um, soon. Um, Svetlana Alpers also talks about this work as the madness of vision, um, and Jonathan Curry suggests that this is about um, a corporal vision or body luminous of sight because you know think about the density of the paint. There's like a really kind of haptic quality to that. Um, it's also you know they sort of talk about baroque visuality and that it's um, softly focused, strongly haptic, and has this tactile quality. And meaning it's not um, explicitly optic. And I'm really curious about issues of opticality. Um, so and um, well, I'll talk about this in a minute, but um, in Dutch paintings, there's an attention to many things instead of a few sort of, one sort of focused one. Um, the way things are modeled is not by light and shadow sort of modeling over an object, but light reflected off, so like glare. Um, and um, this, these, again, are not clearly framed, but they're fragmentary. Um, 
And this is as opposed to um, Cartesian perspective. So um, a perspective that's really linear, it's really rational, um, and um, it's kind of mathematical um, construction of space. And it's very rational. It suggests that there's a single viewer, um, and that if there's like one viewer, there's one point of view that's really fixed. And it's sort of disembodied in a way. It has all these expectations of spectatorship. Um, whereas Baroque painting assumes that there's these sort of multiple areas of focus, and they're, they're much more um, embodied in some way. So I started making work, actually I don't have the source here, but this was from a Baroque painting that, um, like I was curious about that idea of like light like, glaring or light reflective. It's so bright actually. But um, that idea of like reflected off of an object. So this piece is this kind of pearl necklace that's worn by this character in the image, and um, the glare or the paint sort of marks are, are articulated by flats on the on the object, so that when you glare light onto it, it glares as if as the painting kind of did. Um, and I also recreated just the fragment that I could see in the image, so um, it's not visible to me. I don't make it, so I sort of leave. Um, I don't imagine the rest of the piece. And in a way, I'm interested in how the body is kind of implied, but not present. Um, and uh, that it's kind of in perspective. Like, it's kind of in perspective. That idea of perspective is a really curious one to me, though, because perspective is an optical construction. It's um, something that you do to an image. It's not something you do to an object, because objects are inherently perspectival. So um, that kind of, these are very contingent when you look on them, like, look at them. Like, on the body, if you can imagine, it's like a three-quarter view, but on um, in space, when you look at it, you sort of assume something about the way that it exists. So um, as you move space again, you're, you're, um, uh, it's very contingent in terms of how you understand it. And this is another piece <coughs> of, um, by Dirk, Dirk Van Sanford. The previous one is by um, Vermeer. Um, and this is Hoogstra, 1645. And I'm really interested in their wrongness on the body and their wrongness frontally, and that at some moment you turn to the right position and they kind of seem right. And then I shift to the Academy Awards. I'm looking at all these moments, and actually some of these pieces I sort of talk through um, different bodies of work. It's not necessarily that this is linear, but this piece um, that I'm about to show you, this piece here actually, was part of that same exhibition where I was looking at sketches and Victorian photographs and sort of replicating all of these objects within the same kind of continuum. Um, but I was looking at the Academy Awards, and I was really interested in um, these, this sort of representation of luxury through the celebrity or this internet archive of uh, paparazzi photographs recorded on the red carpet. And so, um, it's Penelope Cruz, and I replicated her earrings. Again, what I couldn't see, I wouldn't replicate. So in this, actually, the earrings are reversed. But in this one, I replicate the one I could see, and then just the tip of the jewel is sort of poking behind her cheek. Um, and of these images. In this piece, um, she was sort of the one who actually didn't make a replica of that, but Helen Mirren and cropping them as they were sort of cropped by body. And then Olivia Thurley um, in this piece, not just cropping them, but also capturing um, the gesture of um, her body as she was sort of tipping in space. So freezing it in this moment of a gesture, sort of implying this body present, but not, have, not present. And this is Rebecca Miller, replicas of her earrings, what I couldn't see, were left off. And I started to think about color in a different way. Um, so rather than simply being metal, I tried to replicate them in a way where the color was similar to the um, original object. Penelope Cruz again. It's interesting, actually, with Penelope, the first Penelope Cruz earrings I made, for some reason, collectors were really interested in them. And it, it, it had to do something with um, Penelope Cruz as this character. It's almost like... Um, they had this amuletic power to represent her even though she wasn't part of the object. <laughs> so I also, in these pieces I started to think about, like here, um, even though she's at an angle, I'm replicating them as if I'm seeing them, like I'm still thinking about the image and I'm replicating them like they're totally flat, as if you were wearing them and they were sort of flatly projected towards you. Um, and this is Penelope Cruz, she's sort of at an angle, and I started to think about replicating them at the angle in which I saw them. So. Um, one is frontal, and then on the body, like it's sideways, and when you put it onto the body, it's like backwards. So it's actually this really confusing object. It could never possibly be right on your body. So there's this real um, weird thing when it, when it gets returned to the body. I was also interested, like I'm, you know, I'm interested in the internet archive and the way that information streams quickly and that it's a really sort of fractured space. It's a, 
a really kind of disembodied space. So um, the, the speed of this, and when those earrings came out in like 10 minutes, they're like, oh, you want those Penelope Cruz earrings? Well, you can have these. They're close enough. And that problem of manufacture is really interesting to me, too, because I fabricate everything. And I can't possibly keep up with the rate of um, the production of these things within mass production. So that is something that um, I'm sort of starting to think about. And this is Miley Rick's diary. <laughs> Um, so I started looking at these multiple images because I really think about the internet as this sort of fleeting record. It's really unstable. It's an archive of information, but it's constantly changing. Um, and so I started looking at these kind of multiple views, this capture, capture, capture of a time sequence captured in a photograph. Um, and there are sort of different times on the internet, these different images emerge. Um, and then I um, would make these replicas. And in other pieces, I would um, make the object and then crop out what um, was, or like make a block or something that wasn't visually present. But in this work, I would actually just leave it. Just can you hear it Um, and this piece again cropped. It was funny, I gave this lecture at U of O, and 
the student was like, why are you showing these pieces cropped? It's so unfair. <laughs> but I mean, that's the work. It's cropped, like the photograph is cropped. And in this piece, um, the, the, uh, you know, there was glare in the photograph, or blur, and I would, um, in that spot, I would be like a pile of tools where it was kind of glaring or blurring, so that the object could do, could glare, like the image. Um, but actually, it's funny, because the pile of jewels might blur more than it would glare, so it does the kind of reverse thing, which is interesting to me, that discrepancy. Very tall again. Oh, wait, I didn't mean to have So um, then I, um, I heard that uh, Winona Ryder was arrested for allegedly stealing some vulgar jewels that she was loaned. So I went online and I looked up, you know, trying to understand the evolving scenario. And um, a series of images emerged, and I was curious about this idea of the internet as this kind of fractured space, and thinking about different sources and how they afford me different ways of understanding things. And so that I would understand something from a stream of images, um, and they're all partial views of the thing. And I thought it'd be interesting to conflate all of those partial views into one thing to sort of um, you know, represent this way in which I can't understand the actual thing. So these are three views of this one ring that Winona Ryder allegedly stole. And these, each of these views is kind of cropped um, and partial, or one is sort of blown up in scale and one is sort of dwarfed. Um, and so that's that right, and then that's on the body that it's this sort of three ring conflation. And that became really interesting to me to, to, to sort of in the object uh, represent another way that I couldn't understand it, or it's a conflation of these multiple views. And then I made another <coughs> version, another version of um, that with the crops more present, more cleaner, um, just as a kind of formal study. And this was also the bracelet that she allegedly stole, it was like a set. And where the where the image would glare larger, I would um, sort of uh, adhere larger jewels. And the blanks are where I couldn't see behind her wrist. Oh, here's the scary one. There we are, backwards. Um, and so these are the pieces actually that are the Villa Terrace, this next series of images. So I was curious about, I'm curious about both the internet and these sort of serial views and the film and looking at these kind of serial views of an object through space. Um, but they kind of have these different conditions. So I'm looking at these Carrie Mulligan images. So there's one, two, three, and these objects kind of capturing her moment and moving, kind of like those Miley Ray Cyrus ones. Um, and then these are the uh, pieces that are in the show. So that kind of first one cropped by her face, these kind of freezing the gesture of the object floating through space. I have to say these are bad images, they're literally flat off the cut. So they haven't been touched up, but I wanted to show them. Um, and then the third image, which is just a single earring, and you can't really see anything else in the other one. Um, there's also a film theorist that interests me, Kate Monlock, she talks about, she actually talks about screen, the media, film, and, and the internet, and um, talks about film as being here and there, um, and the internet is problematic because um, you're neither here nor there, because you can be in two places at one time, but you become so disembodied or so disconnected from these spaces that you don't exist in either one. So um, that is something that is becoming kind of increasingly curious to me. Um, and also, so I'm also sort of shifting to this um, film piece that, this is part of the collaborative piece that I'm doing with Mike Gray. And so looking at um, To Catch a Thief, and again, these kind of serial movies of an object, um, progressing through space, and this is, um, there's a series of, there's this kind of jewelry procession that exists in this Hitchcock film, Catch a Thief, and there's, um, we took these sort of freeze frames, these stills of these objects, and um, there's, I'll just show you the series, so one, and it's sort of um, proceeding in space and getting larger as she progresses through kind of space. So what I've done, and actually these are also hot off the presses, but um, I'm kind of replicating the object. I'm obviously primarily working in jewelry, and he is an interdisciplinary artist really interested in film and video. Um, and so um, we're I'm making these jewelry objects, and we're going to start um, installing them in space where you know, we're curious about uh, film as a reflection of or a sort of hearing of the real world, but a, a kind of, again, like 
here and there, but kind of neither here nor there. Um, and so making these pieces with a series of mirrors and two-way mirrors that both reflect the object and kind of dissolve it and absorb it. And so they sort of dematerialize and kind of proceed through space. But all I can show you right now is just the two, two versions of this jewelry piece that have been made so far. Um, and, and these are actually my last two images. So um, this piece, which is, that piece replicated, and it's all very flat, but it's sort of um, moving sort of through space, so as it kind of moves around the body, it sort of turns, sort of changes position, and goes around the form. Um, and then this piece I became really interested in, that kind of smearing, or like that blurring of video when you um, pause, and it kind of smears the image, and it glares. Um, so I started to build several, excuse me, things into this object, the cropping of the image, so that top plane is like flat where the image is cropped. Um, and these kind of um, smears, this glare that is accumulating on the form, so, so piling goes on so that um, it kind of blurs the object again and returning to that idea of this kind of optic thing that's happening to a haptic form. So that those are just, they actually take so long to make, it's insane that they're made. And this is actually, we were reading um, we all things as part of the seminar with um, the students in Julian and also thinking of this like, historic article that talks about um, ornament as kind of criminal, And in some ways, now, after I've spent literally like six hours in my studio daily, I mean, it's really insane, um, it's a little criminal. <laughs> so it's just something that's very curious to me. I always think I'm going to end up making these pieces that are literally like a line in space and be very excited with that as a practice. But um, for now, and I think for a while, because all of my ideas are about replication right now, um, because I'm interested in the copy, I'm interested in replication, and I'm also interested in making a representation of something that is a representation so that replication is really critical to my practice. So I'm going to leave you with this and um, open up the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I have six that are already developed up here. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you mentioned the celebrities wearing that, but not the jewelers that Cornelia Parker is an artist that interests me, and she makes work um, of like King Henry VIII's cup, but she'll um, have like a piece of polishing cloth that has the tarnished of King Henry VIII's cup, and it's, um, it's titled that. So all you see is a tarnished cloth, and it's titled King Henry VIII's cup, and you sort of believe, um, or suspend disbelief and, and want to believe that that's actually like the aura of that original object right there, and I think that's part of the way that these kind of celebrity things kind of exist, that um, they're so um, sort of wrapped up in the culture of desire, and that the celebrity's name attached to the object totally frames if someone wants them or not. So sometimes I like choosing someone that's kind of irrelevant, you know, and then people don't want that word. Um, and then people really wanted the Penelope Cruz one, like they all wanted to be Penelope Cruz. Like, it's so funny to me to think about these kind of cropped images or like a dead blank spot on this thing. And they're also, um, they're so dead, like they're not brilliant, they're sandblasted, they have a very dead surface. So there's so much encoded <coughs> form of that original um, image that they can never be that thing. But I'm curious about the aura of the celebrity and how it's impossible to actually achieve that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you have a
body's images and then um, they <coughs> by placing them on the body. So they have these discrepancies when they're back onto the body um, that really interest me that I think are kind of critical to understanding the work. What about the earrings that fall in the air? Like how do they feel? You know, like have you tried on the earrings? Yeah, they're wrong. I mean you wear them and they're supposed to be swinging and then they're like just like, yeah. they look flaccid actually. They're straight on the body. <laughs> How did you think of the idea to make it like more like busy in the back and just kind of like plain on the more, back? More um, busy in the back? Yeah, you know, like you have all that like great stuff in the back. Like I, I don't yeah. know, and like how to, like it hangs like on your body. Like I just like would never like think of something like that. It's really I mean, it's because I'm interested in um, delivering this visual information kind of slowly. So I thought if the front could be almost blank and you make an assumption about the object and that it could sort of unravel three-dimensionally and slowly, um, and that the really dense part of the object is something that you can never visually access. Um, that becomes interesting to me in terms of how something unravels visually. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like,
a metal. Uh, the jewels are kept out of metal, actually. Um, I take a rod and a wire of metal, and I um, carve it with a file. I sort of carve these facets into the file, and I cut it off, and I carve, and I cut, and I carve, and I cut. And so I have the left jewels, and then I do set them in settings that I need to fabricate So the, the only part that's actually carved is the, are the jewels. Process, do you think about like the viewer and how they're interpreting it? Because you, um, as you were saying before, the pieces with the flat front and the back mm -hmm. that was more complicated. How do you go about like when is your thought process about the viewer? All I guess. Uh, spectatorship. I don't know if it's about um, the final viewer, but it's always about conditions of spectatorship. So, um, so just during the and time. these sort of different formats and what you can understand from different formats of um, receiving the image or visual information. Um, so I think that's what you